and Mark 1 last week. So you, met, you guessed it, Mark 2 this week. And uh, let's turn there, Mark chapter 2. <laughs> you know, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 16 tells us to make the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. As you go on with life, I think that resonates more and more. But the reality is, is that if you don't attack the day and get proactive, it's going to attack you. And before you know it, it's like, man, I had, I had so much planned to do today because I had a free day. Before you know it, it's 9 o'clock. You did nothing. And every day is a battle. Every day is a war in a real way, a war of self-denial, a war of finances, amen, a war at the workplace. And we must learn to win the war to become more. And that's the title of the lesson this morning. Win the war to become more, amen. Just got three points. Point number one, the wonder of God's words. The wonder of God's word. The definition of wonder, you may be wondering. Feeling of surprise mingled with admiration caused by something beautiful, like my incredible wife. Unexpected, unfamiliar. Jordan walking in with those new glasses today. Or inexplicable. The wonder of God's word. Mark chapter 2, verse 1 says, A few days later when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it, and they lowered the, man, lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. It's incredible to have some friends like that. And some of us think it's not that important to have spiritual friends. It's important to have spiritual friends, amen. It continues. Says in verse eight or verse six, now some teachers of the law were sitting there, thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately Jesus knew in his spirits that this is what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, Why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get get up, take your mat and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. The wonder of God's word. Now, Jesus, when he went on his ministry, everything he said out of his mouth was God's words. John 1 verse 14 says, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. So anything Jesus said, it was like just the Bible coming at you. And even if it wasn't here in the Bible, it's like, hey, if it's, it's, coming, if it's coming directly from the mouth of God, it's God's words. Yeah, yeah it's so interesting is that all of these crowds come to him. It says they, there, there was, they, they, they piled into the house. There, there wasn't even room in the doorway. And it says, what did he do? He didn't show that. He didn't just... Uh, show the magic tricks. He didn't just show them something crazy, this or that. What did he do? It says in verse, it says in verse, uh, uh, verse two, it says, when they came in such large numbers, what did he do? It says, he preached the word to them. You know, I think a lot of us, we want to have an impact. We want to do something great, but we, we think that we're really awesome or we think we can become really awesome and then we'll be able to help a lot of people. Here's the thing. Outside of God's word, you're, you're not going to have an eternal impact. Yeah, come on, bro. And some of us, it's like you study the Bible, or maybe you've been coming to church. Like, you know, it's good to come to church and get my fill, my spiritual fill. I'll never forget sitting in the Bible with a guy. And uh, he, was, he had, uh, uh, was a military guy, and he'd done a lot of incredible things in the military. It wasn't incredible. It's hard, hard to just Tim over here. But he was a military guy, and he served our country and this and that. And we did the discipleship study and showed him what it really meant to follow Jesus. And he said, he's like, this is awesome. I, I see that the these are the teachings of Jesus. He says, I think God's some calling me to something different. He's like, I, 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 
I think he's calling me into a deeper place. And, and here's the reality. Now, now people, your, your job may change, but God's purpose is the same for everybody. It's to walk with him and to preach his word, amen? The wonder of God's word. You know, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 reads, The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. You know, the, the incredible thing is that the power of God's word transcends anything else secularly, anything you could put a price tag on. There's no program you can take. There's no AA program you can go to that's going to give you the strength and the power that God's word can. And whatever we're going through right now, I think we live in a time, we live in the TikTok era, the Instagram era. We, we sort of revolving out of the Facebook era. I start feeling old, go on, go on campus, start talking to people. Hey, you on Facebook? They're like, Facebook? Yeah, I'm 60 years old. I'm like, sorry. So I guess we're evolving out of Facebook. Amen. But we're in an era of people, man, they, they want a quick fix. They want the 30-second the TikTok. Maybe, maybe, hey, maybe they're, they're patient. Maybe they'll stick around for the four-part TikTok series on the topic. But, man, we want to see something in five minutes, and then, man, that's going to inspire us to change. The reality is that there's no quick fix to transforming your character. But there's one thing you guys I, I know about, and I'm going to let you guys in on a little secret, that has the power to transform anybody's character. It's right here. You may not have a physical copy. You can get one for free on your phone, amen? That's the wonder of God's word. Now, we see another incredible uh, part of the story here is that these guys, this paralyzed guy, it's like, man, he's struggling there, and his friends come together like, hey, we're going to take you to Jesus to get you healed. And they, they get there. Well, maybe they overslept a little bit. They're like, darn it. They get there. It's busy. So they, but they, they're, they're proactive. What do they do? They take him up to the roof. And here's the thing. So in first century Palestine, the, the roofs, there, there would be beams. I know you, most of you guys probably already know this. But there were, there were beams about three feet apart. And then in the middle, there'd be brushwood and clay. They would fill the middle. And so it, it was strong enough to keep the water out, but it was loose enough where they could just dig through it. So some of you guys, it's like you imagine them sort of just crashing through the ceiling like a Kool-Aid man or something. It wasn't quite like that. It was a little more subtle. But they lower him down, and he gets connected to Jesus. He's healed. His sins are forgiven. You know, it's incredible here. We see the power of having spiritual friends in your life. That when you have spiritual friends in your life, they're going to draw you closer to Jesus so you can get the healing that you need. I'll never forget when I was at San Francisco State and uh, uh, was not living a spiritual life. But I, I reached a moment, and I'll say moments, where I wanted, wanted to get closer to God. You guys ever had those? Yeah. Sort of like an emotional feel. Like, man, I, ah, man I'm, I'm getting low. I feel depressed. I need to get closer to God. So I'd go to church on a Sunday. I'd go and do it to a Bible study on campus. But it was more so for my conscience. I'd go, I'd feel it better, and then I'd go back to my life of sin. I'd go out. I'll never forget one Friday night, got together with uh, uh, some Christ Christian group. who was, I had a club on campus. We got together for dinner on a Friday, and then that Friday night went from there straight to the bars. What? Right? That's, I, was, I, I got my spiritual itch, but then I went to hang out with my real friends. And I think a lot of us, you, maybe your guests here this morning, like, you know, it's cool to have this group on a Sunday, but... I have my real friends outside the church. Don't be deceived. That the bad company corrupts good character. That's what the Bible says. So the, the idea is like, no, I'm going to be the spiritual one and bring my friends closer to God. There, there's strength in numbers right there. If you feel like you're the one spiritual one, one in, in a group of 10 friends, one, you're probably not that spiritual. Two, they're going to make you more unspiritual than you're going to make them spiritual. And we got to connect through the power of God, through the wonder of God's word. Amen? Now, the last part of this passage here, the Bible says that, tells us that, or Jesus himself says, the Son of God has authority on earth to forgive sins. That's Mark chapter 2, verse 10. This is a great scripture to bookmark right here, maybe highlight it on your phone, because it, it debunks one of the most prevalent false teachings around the world. Because you talk about, you go and you share the word, share the gospel. Like, hey, you know, the Bible, Jesus calls us to repentance. Hey, you say, repent, be baptized. And then a lot of people say, hey, thief on the cross. 
thief on the cross, he didn't repent. He was, he was nailed to a cross. He just said something to Jesus. Boom, he made it to heaven. Well, let's go to Luke chapter 23. People might say, hey, go to Luke 23, man. The thief on the cross, that's sort of my shtick. Like, I'm, I'm sort of that thief. But I, I love God, so I know I'm going to make it to heaven. Luke 23. And Luke 23, verse 39. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God? He said, since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Wow. Boom, this guy gets salvation. An incredible story, but one, one thing that we got to understand here, one little caveat, is that Jesus was physically on earth. Yeah. Now, here's the thing. Jesus is still here on earth, but it's in a spiritual sense, through us and through his spirit. And so th there, there's no principle of just getting your sins forgiven by a conversation you had with God. That when Jesus was here, he had authority, and this was that last demonstration of that authority before he died and ascended to heaven. Amen? Amen. The wonder of God's word. Point number two, accept the fact to have true impact. Accept the fact to have true impact. Mark chapter 2, verse 13. Once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him, and he began to teach them. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him. And Levi got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors... They asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have come to call the righteous, not the righteous, but sinners. And the church said, accept the fact to have true impact. You know, here, this is the calling of Levi, more well known as Matthew. That's how you know him. Gospel of Matthew has got a book in here. And he, call, he calls Matthew. Now, what was Matthew's job? The, the Bible says he was a tax collector. Where was he ta a tax collector? He was a, he was a tax collector right there on the, the Sea of Galilee in Capernaum. Now, why was that significant? Well, it's significant because Galilee, that passageway, that was part of the bridge that connected Asia and Europe. And so thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people would travel through there each week. And Matthew was charged with taxing those people. So you, can, you may have guessed, but he wasn't a very, it's not a very popular profession to be in. And so he was a tax collector. And so as people would come through and, and pass through, he'd, he'd, they'd pass through really the, the first century customs right there. And he, here was the sticky part, though, is that there wasn't a strict tax code that people really understood and so when they would come through, Matthew's job was really just to try to milk as much money as he could out of people. And then, and he, so he'd turn in his quota to his overseer, or those, the, those who were above him. And then whatever he could get above the quota, they would just line their pockets themselves. And so th these were corrupt people. These were unpopular people. Yet this guy became one of the 12 apostles. Amen. Anyone can change. And the reality is that out of the 12 apostles, Matthew gave up the most. Matthew gave up the most. Why? You look at Peter, James, John, Andrew. These guys were fishermen, right? The fishermen, you could leave the lakes. You could leave the fish. You could follow Jesus for as long as you want. Then you could, you could fall away. You could come back, and those fish are still going to be there. But, man, but Matthew, man, he was working for Herod. He, he, was, he was working in a very tight ship right there. And that's not something you can just walk away from and then come back to. Once you leave that, he's burning those bridges. 
He gave up so much, but the awesome thing is, is that Jesus gave him so much more. He didn't know it at the time. He says, God, Jesus, I'm going to follow you. I want true purpose. I don't know what that's going to look like, but I want to follow you. What, what did he get? Well, Mark chapter 10, Jesus says, truly I tell you, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me in the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times in the, as much in this present age. Not only that, along with persecutions, amen. amen. And in the age to come, eternal life. Yeah. And so Jesus promises here, he says, hey, I'm going to give you so much more in this present age. I'm going to give you so much more than you're giving up. So he gave up a lucrative career and a lot of finances, but what did he gain? One, he gained peace. And you can't put a price tag on peace. No amount of money can buy peace and a clear conscience. Yes. And so he gave up the life of sin he was in, followed Jesus, and he was able to sleep at night. He got peace. Number two, he, drained, he gained purpose. Yes. Is that, man, he was collecting money. He was just scamming people. He was taking people's money. But he had no real purpose. But now he became a disciple of Jesus, and he had a purpose to save as many as possible. He got purpose. And lastly, he didn't know it at the time, but he made an everlasting impact on the world through his writings. The first text found in the New Testament, the Gospel of Matthew. Is that not awesome? All of this because he accepted the fact. He accepted the fact of 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18, which speaks of the empty way of life handed down to us from our ancestors is that Matthew, like all of us, had been passed down a way of life. What was the way of life? Hey, make a lot of money, buy nice things, fit inside the box of society, and we're going to be fired up about it. Matthew stepped outside of the, that box, that empty way of life. He accepted the fact and became a man of true impact. Amen? The challenge for us is the same. To accept the fact that God's word and God's way is the only way and when we do, we're going to have a true impact. You may say, hey, this is awesome, man. It's great. I got my own path lined up. And here's the thing. Your path may look incredible. You may be, even be off to a great start. Maybe you're a student of the U. Man, you're, you're, you've, you aced, you got 4.0 your first semester, your first year. Man, you're, you're cruising. You're like, man, things are awesome. Well, I would encourage you with Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12, which reads, there's a way that appears to be right. But in the end, it leads to death. There's a way that appears. And here's the thing. You may be starting off on a great path, but I can promise you that if the finish line isn't Jesus, it's going to end in destruction. Amen. Amen. Point number three. This one comes from Kobe Bryant's high school English teacher, which is point number three is rest at the end, not in the middle. Rest at the end, not in the middle. Mark chapter 2, verse 18. Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. Some people came and asked Jesus, how is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not? Jesus answered, how can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? They cannot, so long as they have him with them. But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. And on that day, they will fast. No one sews a patch on unshrunk cloth or a cloth on an old garment. Otherwise, the new piece will pull away from the old, making the tear worse. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins, and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as his disciples walked along, they began to pick some heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? He answered, have you read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the day of Abathar, the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for priests to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. 
You know, this is a very interesting passage because this really addresses the biggest collision and the biggest point of contention that Jesus had in his ministry where the Pharisees was the, the, the uh, what's the word? Application. Application. It can be a tough one. The application of the Sabbath. Right. So what it was is this was, man, this is something they, they rested their head on going back all the way to the Exodus. Man, God said, hey, that, that seventh day is a day of rest. And then the Pharisees, see, they're like, wait, Jesus, why, why are you working, man? This is, well, this is like one of our biggest things. We rest on Saturday. We don't do anything. What are you? But you're doing work. He's like, man, how could this guy be from God when he's not observing God's law? Now, the question is, OK, well, was God was Jesus sort of aloof to the, the laws of God? Was he? Was, oh, should he make a mistake here? mistake here? No, that wasn't the case. But there was an administration of the Sabbath that God commanded in Exodus. Let's check it out. Exodus chapter 31. Make sure Jesus doesn't end up in hot water here. Exodus chapter 31. Exodus chapter 31, verse 14. Observe the Sabbath. Because it is holy to you, anyone who desecrates is to be put to death. Those who do any work on the day must be cut off from their people. For six days work is to be done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day is to be put to death. The Israelites are to observe the Sabbath, celebrating it for the generations to come as a lasting covenant. It will be a sign between me and the Israelites forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Clear application of the Sabbath here. He says, hey, observe the Sabbath or be put to death. So the question is, so so what's going on here? Well, first of all, we have to understand what was the purpose of the Sabbath. Well, it's in Exodus chapter 16. Jump back a few chapters. Exodus chapter 16, verse 29, says, Bear in mind that the Lord has given you the Sabbath. That is why on the sixth day he gives you bread for two days. Everyone who is to stay where they are on the seventh day, no one is to go out. Or what was the purpose of the Sabbath? It was to be a day of rest and a a day to replenish. And what it was, it was a covenant of mercy as God's people came out of Egypt. They'd been working hard every single day, every single hour. God said, hey, I'm going to give you a day to rest. It was a covenant of mercy, and it was a covenant of rest. Now, okay, so does he he abolish the Sabbath? What what happens in the New Testament? Jesus comes on the scene. He doesn't abolish it, but the, the application of it shifts. The application of it shifts. And it's understanding the the relationship between the Old Testament and the New New Testament. The Old Testament being a physical foreshadowing of the spiritual realities of the New Testament. Another interesting thing is that some people try to get caught up on the Sabbath. Hey, do you you guys do the Sabbath? There's 612 other laws in the Old Testament. People know like maybe one or two or three. But it's like, hey, well, you guys don't do this. All right, well, you don't even know the other 612 of them. So... Even at the devotional on Friday, nobody could even name the Ten Commandments. Oh, not even ten of them, let alone 613 of them. Yeah, this this was the biggest point of contention in Jesus' ministry. So let's explain the covenant or the Sabbath under the new covenant. You guys want to do that? We're going to look at two scriptures, Hebrews chapter 4. Rest at the end, not in the middle. Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. For we also have had the good news proclaimed to us, just as they did, but the message they heard was of no value to them, because they did not share the faith of those who obeyed. 
Now we who have believed enter that rest just as God has said. So I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. And yet his works have been finished since the creation of the world. For somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in these words. On the seventh day God rested from all his works. And again in the passage above he says, they shall never enter my rest. Therefore, since it still remains for some to enter that rest, and since those who formerly had the good news proclaimed to them did not go in because of their disobedience, God again set a certain day, calling it today. This he did when a long time later he spoke through David, as in this passage already quoted, Today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who who enters God's rest also rests from their works just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience. You know, at face value, it kind of looks like the writer of Hebrews is like, hey, you got to observe the Sabbath. Make sure you get your rest. Now, the emphasis here is on the rest, that God wants to make sure we have our rest. You know, the Sabbath as a sin is mentioned 20 times in the Old, or or violating Sabbath is mentioned 20 times in the Old Testament, never in the New Testament about violating the Sabbath being a sin. Yet here, the writer of Hebrews is like, man, it's so important to be the rest to make sure that you enter God's rest. And and you, you may think like, okay, well, that means I need to observe the Sabbath. No. It's not the Sabbath, he says, you are observing the Sabbath in the terms of resting physically, but resting spiritually. What type of rest? How do we connect with this rest? Back in the, in the Old Covenant, they would start at Friday at sundown, and they would do nothing till Saturday at sundown. It's like, okay, well, what do I need to do today? Is it some observation, maybe some of it? No. In a physical sense, absolutely not. Go to, go to Revelation chapter 14. And we'll close here. Revelation chapter 14. How do we enter the rest of God? Old Testament was the Sabbath. What is it in the new covenant? Revelation chapter 14, verse 13. Then I heard a voice from heaven say, write this. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labor, for their deeds will follow them. Here it says, man, where do we get our rest? The Bible says we get our rest in heaven. Therefore, the Sabbath day in the Old Covenant was the physical foreshadowing of a spiritual place of rest, that being heaven under the New Covenant. So to enter his rest is to enter heaven itself. Amen. Amen. As I, I was just kind of discouraging. I just wanted to kind of rest for a day. So I hear Jesus, hey, our time is short, man. God wants us to make the most of every opportunity. He says, hey, when you get to heaven, don't worry. You'll be able to rest a lot up there. But until then, you got to work the fields. Amen. You know, I want to encourage us. You know, a lot of us have that, the, the principle or sort of the idea of, you know, when I get older, especially those who are guests, get the, have the idea of, hey, you know, I'm going to get, I'm really going to work for God at the end of my journey. I'm going to sort of have fun in my, in my teens and my 20s. But then when I get older, when I get to be 50, 60, man, then I'll find a church. Then I'll start doing something for God. Here, here's the thing. James says we don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. So, hey, you might have that chance to work for God at the end of your life. But God says the time to rest is not now in your youth. The time to rest is when you get to heaven. Yeah. You know, and in closing, I want to encourage us to win in three areas. On, Point number one, we got to take the W from the wonder of God's words. Then we take the A from accept the fact to have true impacts. Then you take the R from rest to the end, not in the middle. What do you get? You get war. What have we got to do? We've got to win the war to become more for our God. Amen.